And I'd like to take this time to introduce Deborah Dean, who will get us going with our program this morning. Good morning again, everyone. We have a great speaker again today, and I'm really looking forward to this one. Victoria Bricker is her name. And Victoria uh, was a cultural anthropologist for over 50 years, who's carried out research among the Maya of Southern Mexico for 50 plus years. She said, I was born in Hong Kong in 1940 and spent the war years under Japanese occupation in Shanghai, China. In 1947, I emigrated with my parents and younger brother and sister to Seattle, Washington, where I spent the rest of my childhood. And I asked her to send something a little quirky or funny along to get this kicked off, and she said, I have worn eyeglasses with white frames since high school, which has helped people at Okamak recognize me with or without a mask. <laughs> Thank you, Victoria. <laughs> I was born in the Matilda Hospital on the Peak in Hong Kong on June 15, 1940, the day after Paris fell to the Germans during World War II. The news of the fall of Paris came as such a shock to my mother, an English woman from London, that she went into labor and delivered me the next day, one month before the predicted date of my birth. In those days, the lying-in period for women and their newborns in hospitals was two weeks. During that period, the Japanese army had reached the outskirts of Canton, and the Hong Kong authorities wanted all women and children to leave the island before the Japanese arrived. Accordingly, when my mother and I left the hospital, we went directly to a ship in the harbor where we were joined by my grandmother who had come down from Shanghai after my birth, and my father's sister, who was also living in Hong Kong. The ship took us to Shanghai, where my par mother's parents were living. My father joined us there a few months later. My mother never returned to her home in Hong Kong. The Japanese had invaded Shanghai in 1937 and occupied the Chinese parts of the city, but they had left the international sectors the international settlement controlled by the British and the American and French concessions, alone until December 8, 1941, the day after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, when America declared war against Japan. Many homes and businesses belonging to Europeans in those parts of the city were taken over by the Japanese after that date. Before then, my grandfather had quietly transferred the lease on our house to the name of my father, who, because he was born in Austria, a province of Germany after um, 1938, was not regarded as an enemy by the Japanese authorities in Shanghai. For this reason, we were able to continue living in our house throughout the war. Shortly after my brother Frank was born in January of 1943, all British and American citizens in Shanghai were ordered to report to internment camps in the city that were called civil assembly centers. They were established in retaliation for the relocation of American citizens of Japanese descent from the west coast of the United States after President Roosevelt's executive order in February 1942. Because my mother and I had British nationality by birth, we were required to enter such a camp. My father was not affected by this order because his birth in Vienna, uh, nor was my brother because he was born in Shanghai. My mother brought him along with us anyway so that she could continue nursing him and caring for him in other ways. The next slide contains part of the list of inmates of the so-called Civil Assembly Center on UUN Road where we were interned. The blue arrow points to our names on the list. You see Reifler there, which was my surname. It is followed by a sketch map of the campgrounds that was apparently produced by one of the residents of our camp. 
the playing field on the left side of that map lay in front of our hut. And I remember playing with my brother on that grassy area. We called it a green in those days. At some distance behind that field and separated from our camp was a multi-story apartment building. I think you can see it there in which a friend of my father had an apartment that overlooked the campground. My father came every Sunday morning to stand at the window for a, a while. My mother placed Frank's buggy in sight of the window every day of the week so that no one would suspect that my father was watching us on Sunday mornings. The next two slides refer to a visit the, that the three of us made to our house during that period. And I quote from the, the book, Captives of Empire, the Japanese internment of allied civilians in China, 1941 to 1945. UN road internee, Henrietta Reifler, my mother, was accompanied by a guard to visit her non-interned father who was recovering from a heart attack. The guard, once out of sight of the camp, became quite friendly and talkative. He allowed Reifler and her stateless spouse to spend some time alone while her parents played with her children and allowed her husband to accompany them on a bicycle back to the neighborhood of the camp. However, once within sight of the compound, the guard was transformed. According to my mother, as we reached the compound, the guard changed. He became an automaton, his face a mask, his eyes cold and without expression, as he said curtly, you can go. He made no response when I thanked him for accompanying us. Although I do not remember the trip to and from our house, which we made in a rickshaw, I do remember leaning across a bed from my grandmother in order to chat with her on that occasion, at which she gave me a nougat candy to eat. We were, in the, we were in the detention camp for only 15 months before we were released and permitted to return to our home in the city. This was because the Japanese authorities did not regard my father as an enemy alien. However, my grandparents were interned in another camp the day after we were released because they were British citizens. The other British and American citizens in the camp remained there until the end of the war in August of 1945. Toward the end of the war, Shanghai was bombed by members of the US Air Force, who after leaving the Philippines early in the morning would arrive over our city at noon. This was a daily occurrence that I remember well. And to this day, I do not like the sound of fireworks on the 4th of July. One of my high school teachers was among the airmen who dropped bombs over Shanghai then, as I informed him when he told us about it in class when I was in 11th grade. I understand from my uh, younger sister, 10 years younger than I, that he, what, she took the cor same course from him that he did not mention <laughs> his uh, bombing of Shanghai in that class again. This, the next photograph was taken in the garden behind our house in Shanghai at the end of the war in 1945. It depicts my brother and me with our father. It is followed by a photo of my family in the garden behind our house that was taken in 1947, shortly before we left Shanghai and emigrated to Seattle, Washington where my father took up a position as a professor in the Far Eastern Department at the University of Washington, where he was in charge of the Chinese language program. And then we have um, a photo of the three of us uh, taken several years after we arrived in the States, standing on the sidewalk in front of our house in Seattle. Now the last photo in this series um, is of our house in Shanghai. It was taken many years after we came to America by a friend who visited Shanghai in the 1990s. According to friends who visited Shanghai more recently, that house no longer exists, having been replaced by a high-rise building. 
My first real adventure in living began during my sophomore year at Stanford University when I participated in a semester abroad program in a rural region of southern Germany during the winter and spring of 1960, about 12 kilometers south of Stuttgart in the state of Baden-Württemberg. It was during that semester that I took my first course in cultural anthropology from a Stanford professor named George Spindler. Because the Stanford abroad program, uh, uh, excuse me, campus was located on a ridge high above a valley where there were five peasant villages, you see one of them down below, Dr. Spindler decided to use his course as an opportunity for us to learn how to carry out field work in a new environment. He told us that our first assignment was to become acquainted with a family in one of the villages in the valley below our campus and to write a paper about family relations in that community. As it happened, one of the families in the village of Beutelsbach, shown from the hillside of the first picture, had been tipped off to my arrival by a fellow student who lived across the hall from me in my dormitory during the previous term. She had been a member of a group of students who had spent a semester abroad in the same location the year before. Accordingly, on the second day after my arrival, two men came to our campus from the village and asked the director of the Stanford program to introduce them to me. And that is how I met the husbands of two members of that family two days before classes began that semester. The family in question consisted of two sisters and their brother, their spouses, and small children. I then introduced my two friends from my freshman year to the three families who served as the families that we wrote about in the papers for our anthropology class. So now let me introduce you to the town of Beutelsbach, where all three families had their homes. This slide shows the vineyards below the Stanford campus, where they raise grapes for wine. The little houses, those little structures that you see in the middle of the picture, uh, they served as tool sheds where they kept their farming equipment. And note how many of them they were, how close together they were, indicating how small their plots of land were. That was because land was inherited by both men and women equally in that part of Germany. And over time, the plots had become smaller and smaller until they were too small to make use of draft animals and tractors. And while I was there, tractors were used only for transportation between fields scattered all over the region. The next slide represents a close-up of grapevines beside the road between the Stanford campus and the Rems Valley below. Let us now look at what the town itself looked like in 1960. This is the brook that ran through the town after which it was named. It wound through the town forming the shape of a bag, which is Beutel in German, and Bach means brook. Hence, Beutelsbach, Bagbrook, was the town's name. The next slide depicts the principal church in Beutelsbach, the Evangelische Kirche. It is followed by a view of a typical house in the town with quilts hanging from windows on the upper story to air in the morning during the winter. Before the end of our semester in Germany, I and my friends decided to ask the related families that we had come to know well, whether we could spend the month of June that year with them, helping them on their fields. They were happy to have us move in with them for those weeks. And we spent that month pruning grapevines on their plots on the hillsides, as well as harvesting hay, cherries, and strawberries on their long, narrow fields in the valley. Now, the pictures I have shown you so far were all taken in 1960. I returned to Beutelsbach eight years later after I married with my husband to show him where I had first learned about anthropology and to visit the families who had befriended me in 1960. Now this slide shows us having dinner on the SS United States on our way to pick up our new Volkswagen car from the factory in Wolfsburg, Germany before continuing on to Beutelsbach and ultimately to France. 
In this picture here, the uh, Sanford campus is visible on the ridge above the valley in springtime. And this slide here shows me standing in front of the main building of the Stanford campus in 1968, this picture taken by my husband. The upper floors of this building served as a women's dormitory in 1960. And the first floor housed the dining room for both men and women, the kitchen and lounges. And this was uh, very unusual for a uh, Stanford dorm to have both the, the men and women eating uh, in the same dining room. And I like that. Now this is the last slide um, uh, from Beutelsbach, and um, it shows me sitting with the adult members of the three families during that visit in 1968. I am sitting between the two women on the left side of the picture, and you can recognize me by the white frames on my glasses. So what did I get out of this experience? I learned that I enjoyed jumping into a new culture and learning what made it tick. And on the strength of what I learned from my experience in Beutelsbach, I decided then and there that I would study anthropology in graduate school after I graduated from Stanford in 1962 with a major in philosophy and a minor in the humanities honors program. After graduating from Stanford, I went to Harvard where I was trained as a cultural anthropologist and that is where I met my, first, my husband, Harvey Bricker, during my first semester there. He was an archeologist specializing in the Paleolithic period of Southern France. As a result, I lived for about three years in a peasant community in the painted cave region of Southwestern France. Now the first slide in this series depicts a woolly rhinoceros from the faint, famous painted cave of Lascaux in Southern France. And the next slide portrays a horse from the same cave in Southern France. The years I spent in France provided an interesting comparison with my experience in Beutelsbach. The commune of Tursac in which we lived had only 200 people compared with 3,000 people in Beutelsbach. We rented a small cottage on a farm in a hamlet of only 39 people. And the next slide provides a view of the center of Tursac. You see, it's very small compared to what um, the pictures I showed you of Beutelsbach. The hamlet in question uh, lay at the top of the hill beyond the town center. And the Buisu farm where we lived is visible at the top of the hill in, in this slide. And our cottage was across the courtyard uh, from the Buisu farmhouse in 1966 when, we, when I first went there. In October of that year, Harvey and I participated in the harvesting of grapes in the Buisu's vineyard. Uh, Harvey is the man wearing a green sh shirt, a dark green shirt and pants in this picture. And if you look to, the, to his right side, your left, I am standing uh, behind him. The nearest town of any size was Lezézy, a few kilometers from Tursac. The site Harvey excavated is just around the nose of the cliff. The main street of Lezézy, uh, with the um, red Volkswagen car that, that uh, we purchased um, in Germany in 1969, is parked in front of one of the shops. This view of our car was captured on a postcard, copies of which were sold in the town for a number of years. The site of the Abripato is behind that fence there. And this is on the street, um, uh, unpaved street uh, above the main street of the town. And the grid used for specifying the locational coordinates of artifacts at the site is shown in this slide. And the first room in there, where you see those blue doors, the first blue door uh, leads uh, into a room in the cliff, which was used as a lab where I helped Harvey analyze artifacts from the site. And the room beyond it was used as a storeroom. 
Now, Harvey is shown in the next slide, excavating at the site of Le Tambouré in the foothills of the Pyrenees during the summer of 1975. And uh, the members of the crew that year are shown in this, in this slide. He's on the left side um, of, of front row, and I am um, in that green and black uh, top, uh, seated one person over from him. Um, I participated in the expedition by excavating in the morning and supervising the on-site lab in the afternoons. The next series of slides uh, is concerned with my dissertation research, which was carried out in the mountains of southeastern Mexico. And Chiapas is the uh, a southernmost state of Mexico next to the Guatemalan border. Once again, I found myself living in a peasant community, but this time in a region that is densely populated by Maya Indians. And the town that I worked on, or worked in rather, uh, was Zina Cantan. As in France, the people lived in hamlets, um, not nucleated vi villages like Beutelsbach. Now the one shown here, Apas, on the edge of a ravine had about 600 inhabitants during the 1960s. The household clusters were composed of people related through the male line. The houses uh, were arranged around a compound, and I lived here for a couple of weeks in 1965. Another view uh, shows um, of the same uh, hamlet, um, indicates um, more clearly how the um, houses were clustered, form clustered there. Another hamlet where I spent more time had been cut in half by the Pan American Highway, and that's on the, the right side, the lower right hand corner. It was larger with about 1,500 people in the 1960s. It was called Nabinchauk, uh, Thunder Lake. Now the next sequence of slides uh, is a result of my being invited to take photos at a wedding in still another hamlet in the fall of 1965. The, the name of the hamlet was Nachich, House of Sheep, and the people who lived there did herd sheep. Note the clothes worn by the bride and groom, the bride on the left, the groom on the left, uh, excuse me, the bride on the right and the groom on the left. Those clothes date from the 16th century, when this region of Mexico was conquered by the Spaniards. And it looks like the bride is wearing a burqa. Well, 1492, the year when Columbus discovered the Americas, was also the year when the Spaniards were finally able to drive the Moors out of Spain. Therefore, at that time, there was a strong Muslim influence on Spanish culture and the Spanish clothing of that time is still worn by Maya Indians on ritual occasions. OK, we move on. What you see is the bride and groom. And then uh, to the right of them um, are the uh, godparents of the bride and groom. And then here, we see three musicians playing a medieval European harp, a guitar, and a violin under the eaves of the house. And then the next one shows you the wedding banquet, where the wedding cake consists of enormous tamales wrapped in banana leaves. Now, the title of my dissertation was The Meaning of Laughter in Zena Kantan, a study of the humor of the people of this town. And I collected data in several ways. The Zena Contecos were great storytellers, and many of their stories were humorous. I asked some people to tell me funny stories, which I tape recorded. Other people who happened to know how to write wrote accounts of humorous events for me. And I found that there were three major kinds of humor. One of them consisted of bantering exchanges between young men. And I quote the first young man, I am your father-in-law, so give me, give me your mother as a wife. The second young man replies, no, I am your brother-in-law, so give me your sister as a wife. 
Now, you're probably not familiar with this, but this kind of joking takes place in Spanish, where it's called relajos. And in the African American community, it was, used to be called playing the dozens. The, the most interesting kind of humor has ties with one of the experiences I had in Germany, and I'm going to have to flash back to Germany briefly to explain this. I'm referring here to the carnival season in Germany known as Fushing. And uh, this is a picture of the Endymion Parade in, before Mardi Gras in New Orleans, which is, occurs at the same time of the year. But what I'm really interested in is um, what happens in the town of Rotweil near Beutelsbach on the Monday before the festival known as Mardi Gras or Fat Tuesday in France and New Orleans. The German counterpart of Mardi Gras is called Rosenmontag or Rose Monday. Our anthropology professor had told us that the people of Rotweil were still using the ancient pre-Christian masks and costumes, which was indeed the case as these pictures will show. The first slide is a copy of a postcard that I purchased in Rotweil. It depicts, it depicts men and boys wearing clusters of heavy bells across their chests. They jumped as they moved along in a parade so that the bells would ring. The second slide is a copy of the color photograph I took on that occasion, in which the scenes on the garments worn by the men and little boys can be seen to represent the sprouting of plants in the spring. It turned out that the people of Sinakantan have very elaborate springtime festivals that are related to the one I saw in Rotweil in 1960. And that is where I found the most interesting examples of humor, which formed the nucleus of the book I eventually published on that subject called Ritual Humor in Highland Tree. Chiapas. These festivals represent the high point of the year in Zina Kantan. People dress up in their finery to watch what goes on during those events. Here we see two young men in ribbon hats. In Zina Kantan, it is men, not women, who wear ribbon hats. The next one shows a little boy wearing his first ribbon hat. And the next one shows women and children sitting together at, at such a festival. And the next one shows the main church in Zina Kantan and its churchyard on a festival day. And it is followed by a slide depicting a procession of religious officials. Then we have um, a few scenes from the most elaborate festival in Zina Kantan where most of the joking takes place. First, two performers wearing costumes dating to the 16th century, a female impersonator wearing a dress that is of pre-Columbian style. This is on the left. A red satin shirt, excuse me, a red satin shawl, men's sandals, and a black felt hat from the colonial period. She is called Shinulan a Maya corruption of the Spanish word senora, meaning lady. She represents a Spanish lady. Next to her is a man wearing a red satin jacket and knee breeches and the same kind of black felt hat, all of colonial origin. He is called Cachlan, a Maya corruption of the Spanish word castellano, meaning Spaniard. He represents a Spanish gentleman. They are both dancing to music played on the harp. This slide uh, gives you another view of the Spanish lady on the left. You see the back of the Spanish lady in that case and the Spanish gentleman. Now the next slide depicts two men wearing red turbans surmounted by white straw hats, white shawls, and white shorts. And M-shaped silver masks that represent falling water. They are called whiteheads and as such represent the pre-Columbian Maya red, uh, rain god. 
but they are sometimes also called Montezumas. They are holding red rattles and dancing to music played on a harp. So what we have here are characters representing the period of the Spanish conquest with Spanish gentlemen and Indians and Montezuma, the A Aztec emperor. As they dance, they joke about the Spaniards. The Spanish lady is sometimes called Malinche, the Indian woman who served as Cortez's interpreter in the conquest of Mexico. She is also, she is often regarded as promiscuous and the joking concerns her preference for the Spanish gentleman who is rich, owns a ranch with many cattle and buys her jewelry. The next image shows a Spanish gentleman mounted on a horse and trying to hit a jousting target that is suspended from a rope strung between two poles. Here, as in Rotweil, a major springtime festival recalls scenes from the past. During this festival and others, I tape recorded the conversations that took place among these performance, performers and other people. Many of their remarks were humorous and they provided me with fascinating data for my dissertation. The, the Zena Contecos and other Maya Indians in this part of Chiapas are Catholics. They were Christianized during the colonial period. But in the eastern part of the state of Chiapas, there were Indians who had never been converted to Christianity. They were known as Lacandones because they lived in the remote Lacandone jungle that was not accessible by road. In 1974, Harvey and I flew in a small plane to visit two of our students who were studying the culture of these Indians. We were flying over mountains 8,000 to 9,000 feet high in an unpressurized plane, which could not go above 11,000 feet. As you can see, flying so close to the mountaintops, the scenery was spectacular. The Lacandone settlement was on the shore of this lake, and the landing strip was on the opposite side of the lake. In this photo, I am saying goodbye to the pilot who promised to return three days later to pick us up while a Lacandone man looks on. Then the pilot flew away and we were left alone in the middle of the jungle. After a while, we heard a ploop, ploop, ploop sound and eventually a dugout mahogany canoe bearing one of our students and being rowed by two Lacandone men came into view. They took us to the other side of the lake. In this photo, we are standing in front of our students camp at one end of the Lacandone settlement. You can see the thatch roofed house in which we were staying. In 1974, the Lacandones were still worshiping clay idols. And here is such an idol in the form of a drum. The next photo shows their god house, a thatched roof structure without walls. The name for it is Kuna, which means god house. The interior of the uh, god house appears in the next photo. Now, let's go back one. You see, I'm sitting there. Um, you can see, see my long uh, twist I'm going down my back. I could not see the inside of, I mean, I could not enter the God house because women were not allowed to do that. But my husband went in and he took a picture of the interior of the, uh, of the God house. We were there during the summer while the Lacandones were celebrating their green corn festival. And in this picture, the women are shown in their kitchen making green corn tamales. The Lacandones are still polygynous. Uh, and these women were co-wives of the same man. Lacandone men are well known in Mexico for never cutting their hair. The, ones we, the one we saw beside the plane wore trousers, but the men we saw in their settlement wore dresses, and the women wore skirts and blouses, as is the case here. Our students had hoped to take us to visit places in the jungle, but they had been warned that there were gorillas around and they, that they should not wander far from the settlement, so we did not venture far from their camp. After three days, the pilot returned to pick us up and return us to civilization. 
Harvey and I moved to New Orleans in 1969 to take up jobs at Tulane University. I made one more field trip to Zena Kantan in the summer of 1972. After that, I did not work in Highland Chiapas again, although I did return several times in the 1980s and 1990s to visit the friends I had made there. The job I had at Tulane involved teaching a Maya language that was spoken in the northern part of the Yucatan Peninsula. Over time, I gradually became more interested in the people of that region because of the time I invested in learning their language. These people are also Catholics. We see here the church in the town of Hokaba, where I have done field work on various topics over the year. And this is a picture of a typical house in this town, and I have stayed in houses like that. The people who live here are also peasants, as is true of the people in many towns in the Yucatan Peninsula. The reason for our first visit to Hokaba was to observe the festival of Carnival in the days leading up to Ash Wednesday. By 1971, when that visit took place, I had decided to make a comparative study of ritual humor in the Maya area. And I found some excellent examples of this kind of humor in Hokaba. And you can see the people laughing there. And it involves a figure named Juan Carnival. And we see her one of the scenes that takes place in Hokaba during Carnival. Now, as unexpected visitors to this festival, Harvey was asked to crown the queen of carnival, and I was asked to crown the princess. During the summer of 1971, I had an opportunity to witness a rainmaking ceremony in Hokaba. The women here are preparing tortillas for the ritual meal. In the next photo, the men are praying before an outdoor altar. And they told me I could take pictures. I could not approach the altar. But I, if I stood 10 meters from the altar, I could take pictures. And that's what I did. And it, in fact, I later measured it. And it was indeed 10 meters. Let's go back to the previous one. Some little boys are sitting under the altar, pretending to be frogs, singing, lek, 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 oki, oki, imitating the sound of frogs when it rains. After the ceremony ended, it began to rain, demonstrating the efficaciousness of the ceremony. Now, the Maya couple you see here are two of my closest friends. Their names are Eleuterio and Ophelia, and this is how they looked in 1971. Eleuterio helped me teach the Maya language at Tulane. He would come up every two years in the spring semester and stay in New Orleans and um, participate with me in class and then drill the students individually uh, at other times. And both of these pe people were co-authors of the dictionary we worked on for 14 years. Ophelia was an expert on the names and uses of plants. And she was the one who helped me with the botanical entries for the dictionary. The rest of the photos I have from Hokaba were taken in 1985 when we were collecting plants for the dictionary. Here is a picture of, Elut and, of Eleuterio and me standing in front of a house in Hokaba. We would go from house to house to see what plants were growing wild in their yards and ask permission to collect some of them. In the next um, slide, Ophelia and I are standing in someone's yard. And you see Ophelia is holding a plant specimen that she found there that will later be pressed and dried. And this was in, um, uh, then archived in the Tulane Herbarium. The next photo shows Eleuterio and Ophelia discussing which plants to collect in a more wooded area. And this last photo of that sequence shows Ophelia and me at the end of the day. We are resting before taking a bus back to Merida where she and Eleuterio lived. Ophelia died of a heart attack in 1989. Eleuterio and I continued working on the dictionary together after her death, which was published with her name as well as ours on the title page in 1998. In January of 1999, Harvey and I were visiting Yucatan with our botanist friend, Ann Bradburn, 
who had assisted us with the identification of plants, and her husband. The director of the State Library of Yucatan or organized a recognition ceremony in honor of the publication of our dictionary, followed by a reception to co coincide with our visit. And therefore, in the last slide for this talk, Eleuterio and I appear seated at a table in front of an audience in the library, holding up copies of the published version of our dictionary. And with that event, my ethnographic adventures in living came to an end. I want to uh, begin by thanking Nick Martin for helping me with the images for this show. And particularly for his uh, brilliance in hunting down a photograph of the hospital in which I was born in Hong Kong. <laughs> and uh, I'd be happy to speak right in, speak to the microphone. I'd be happy to take questions. Okay. Yes. With a question which occurred early in the presentation, what was the background of your family originating in China? My father uh, was born in Vienna, and uh, when he was in college, he went to the University of Vienna. He got interested in uh, learning Japanese. Uh, his sister had a book of Japanese haiku form poetry or something, and he decided to learn Japanese. He learned Japanese. And then he realized that the Japanese writing system was based on the Chinese writing system. So he decided to learn Chinese. And um, one thing led to another, and eventually he went, well, he, he um, uh, became uh, very fluent in Chinese. Uh, apparently there were Chinese living in Vienna, and he ended up as an interpreter for the Vietnamese police force. We can come to our conclusions about that. <laughs> but, um, so uh, then he went to Berlin and where he served as a reporter for the China News Agency. And then he went to China himself. That's, that's how he went there. And he, um, uh, he got there at a time uh, when he was the only person in uh, China who was bilingual in Chinese and Berlin. Now this was at the time of the League of Nations. And the uh, Austrian, Austrian delegation to the League of Nations was, uh, had established um, a committee to go to China and help uh, set up peace corps in Chinese cities. And my father was the only person who was bilingual. So he traveled all over China and um, visited all over China as an interpreter. So that's, that's really how China came, came into the picture. In China. Uh -huh. in, in Shanghai. I asked you, Tori, how did uh, her father meet her mother, uh, who was British? Yes. Uh, and uh, was she teaching in China? Or? No, uh, her father uh, was a, um, this is a class explanation, he was a Jewish minister, not a rabbi, but a minister who had been trained in England. And he was head of the, um, of the synagogue in, in, in Shanghai. He lived in Detroit Cooperville. And uh, my, um, my mother was born in London. And um, her parents went out to China and they left their three daughters behind to finish school. But um, her younger sister, her youngest sister wasn't doing well. And so when she graduated from high school, she uh, told her parents that um, they should come out there. And so she went there. It was, it was the greatest adventure of her life. And, um, so she ended up in Shanghai. And uh, when she got there, uh, she was um, she learned that um, someone was teaching Chinese to foreigners for the American Chamber of Commerce. That's my father. <laughs> and uh, so that's how they got together. And uh, she was fascinated with his words as a teacher. So ultimately, uh, they met and um, they married, and then following year, I was born.
Well, in, um, my parents wanted me to learn French because that was a language of civilization. But um, I got an opportunity to start learning Spanish in seventh grade. And since French wouldn't be taught for several years, they thought it was better for me to learn another language. <laughs> and so I started learning Spanish in seventh grade. I did seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. I had a wonderful teacher in the first two years. So I already had the Spanish language. And um, as for my working in Mexico, and then I, um, in addition to that, in third grade, uh, I think my teacher there, her name was Mrs. Liston, probably was Stone. Um, and we, uh, we read about we read about Mexico, and we put on a play um, about Mexico. So I think those things kind of set me up not to go to China, do things there, but actually to take the, um, the opportunity, because I knew Spanish already better, it was easier for me to learn a, a Native American language, uh, because I already spoke the language of the country. So that's why I went to Mexico. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, I'd like to know how many languages do you actually speak and which was the hardest one to learn? Probably English. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I speak English, French, Spanish, and German. And Hawaiian languages. So that makes six. I have worked with Darwin and so. So uh, my father was, was really, really good at languages, and I think I inherited that ability from him. Thank you, Victoria. This is awesome to hear. Uh, I'm very curious, with your wonderful international background, how have you found Gainesville? <laughs> well, really more the point is how we found New Orleans, you know. Uh, we found uh, Gainesville because of uh, Hurricane Katrina. Um, uh, we, we had decided to retire at the end of 2005, and, um, and that was the year of Katrina, and we, we evacuated to uh, Austin, Texas. Um, and, um, but we realized that we could not, we were getting old, and we really couldn't keep going through these very difficult evacuations. We were uh, in exile in, in Texas for uh, seven and a half weeks. And so we we decided that we were going to have to find some way to get out of New Orleans during hurricane season. And the choice was either going to, and, and I wanted to be at the university. You know, I've been in one all my life, even in Shanghai. And um, so, um, uh, the, and we wanted to be within one day's trip of New Orleans. And so it was either going to be Austin or it was going to be Texas. And I had a colleague here, or rather, we had a colleague here at the university uh, at UM. And we, we, we were giving a talk in Boca Raton in the spring of 2006, and we thought we would go to Gainesville afterwards. And we, we were having lunch with her in the restaurant, and we said we were going to go to Gainesville and see the possibilities. But she said, oh, we said, in that case, I'll take you around and show you a place. And we, uh, we found uh, an apartment that we could rent, and we started playing. So that's, and, and we also did, we had also visited Austin. And the cost of living here was lower than in Austin. And we figured that since we were retiring, it made, um, didn't make sense. We should go to the uh, place with the lower cost of living. Agreed? My question is, I'm wondering about the history of your glasses, the white glasses. <laughs> Why did I start wearing them? <laughs> and how, how you keep them white? I mean, I don't keep them white. I buy white frames, but so you have to replace them once in a while, don't you? Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, well, I just think white frames are better on my skin than pink frames or black frames or purple frames. <laughs> but these glasses are weird, and I got them in January. They're they're Greta Garbo. But Greta Garbo wore black frame glasses. I looked her up on the internet. <laughs> and, um, but but I wanted white, I had some white frames and I was at the um, frame shop. And one of the employees remembered uh, the Garbo 
glasses and found that they were a white version, so we ordered them from Italy. And they're weird, but you know, they've been perfect for this situation. <laughs> I have I have a, I have other pairs of glasses in nicer frames. Normally with a, I get the white frames because they're um, for sunglasses. But I have very clear lenses for the camera. Dawn. Victoria Chiapas now is very dangerous, isn't it? Have you, do you still have contact or um, do you know anything further about the area that you've been researching? I, I wasn't aware that it was dangerous. Um, I did uh, get a phone call um, uh, a couple of uh, years ago, many days ago actually, because my calls from New Orleans were being forwarded from the man that I had lived with in Chiapas. This was after COVID. Actually, COVID had already started. So maybe he called me in New Orleans, whatever it was. Um, and I didn't have a sense that it was dangerous of him. Um, uh, Mexico, particularly near the border region, is dangerous. And um, one of my younger sisters is very interested in the, the Romance languages, you know, Spanish, Spanish, and was teaching herself. Portuguese. She had all sorts. So it's some notions about Spanish and pure Spanish. I don't believe there's such a thing as pure Spanish. But she had only been in um, contact with people here in the States who had um, immigrated. So my husband and I decided to take her to Maryland in Yucatan, and, which I thought was probably the safest place to go. And we took her there in 2015. And we, we um, spent a weekend um, showing her around the downtown area. We stayed in the hotel there. And then we let her loose. And um, as a matter of fact, it turned out there actually were one of um, families, one of the mobs there. And but in any case, it didn't affect us. And so she wandered around town, and if she lost her way, then she could ask questions. If I went with her, then people would talk to me. Um, but uh, that was not a, a dangerous situation. But I would not myself go across the border. Any other questions? Well, we thank you again. <laughs> and welcome to Rotan. <laughs> All right, Deb, we have one Adventures in Living left for the series. Stay tuned next week for Marvie. <laughs> Stay well, everyone. <laughs>